This archived clip from Make Live is brought to you by DigiKey. Join us live every second and fourth Wednesday of the month. Great. Well, thanks for being here, first of all. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So you work for MakerBot, but you know a lot about photo and video stuff. What's the connection between MakerBot and photo video? Well, uh, when, when you tell somebody, oh, I've got a 3D printer, they don't know what that means. But if you show them the process of printing, people get really excited. And I, I've seen people stand there and watch 15, 20, 30 minute bills, whole way through to see the process of printing. So from the very beginning, there's always been a call for doing video. And so. so then quickly, what is a, a 3D printer? Uh, well, I, there are many methods of doing this, but it's a means of producing a physical object from a digital file. Uh, in the case of a MakerBot, uh, you, you uh, melt plastic and draw each layer and uh, build layer upon layer until you have an object that's gelled together and you can take it, hold it in your hand, do things with it, make machines. So when it comes to showing with video what a MakerBot does, what, what, what techniques do you use? Uh, well, we, we do a lot of time lapse. Okay. Um, and that's something I've been really excited to do because that's a way to see a pattern that you can't see immediately, uh, sort of compressed into a period of time which you can, you know, you see the ebb and flow, you see what's happening. Right. So how long does, does it take to make a print like, let's say, this one here? Uh, that's probably about three hours. Okay. It depends. You, you get to choose how dense it is. This is fairly hollow, so uh, you, you, it's just a time to draw each layer. This is essentially like a, a pin plotter married to a hot glue gun. Mm -hmm. So you have to draw each layer, move up, and draw another layer. It's and uh, yeah, so this many layers is that much time. So those, those hours it takes to make this, you can compress it down to yeah. just as long yeah. as you want, I guess. Uh, right? right. Well, in, in a time lapse, you can, um, there's no definite rule. But uh, you can change time. You can change the sense, you know, what the interval at which something happens. Um, so. When you're, when you're working with something like this, maybe you want to make, like a, say, a 20 second time lapse of this video, so, of this, uh, this object. So you shoot maybe a lot of frames over a long period of time, but then you just select the ones you want or you, you run them really quickly together. So you see the, the shape of the whole thing happening in far less time than it would take real time. Right. Um, and we were talking before a little bit about just general product, uh, general uh, documentation of projects. Yeah. I guess this is pretty good well, for that. Yeah, so you know, we love doing time lapses so you can see printing, but also we know that our uh, MakerBot operators love doing like the builds of their mm -hmm. bots, which can take maybe a couple days sometimes. Uh, so we, if you're putting together an elaborate project or a machine or doing something that takes a long period of time, you can set up a camera and sort of capture that whole gesture um, and later uh, either compress it down so you can show all the things moving around, all the parts moving around the desk and coming together into the final object or uh, you know maybe something that you couldn't, couldn't tell in the moment like if you were to say uh, shooting somebody moving very slowly across a room, I don't know. Right. So it's, it's, it's like broad strokes. It's showing a big broad stroke of how, how a project is, comes together then. Yep. That's great. And but its cousin would be slow motion photography, where you, you shoot so many frames much faster than you usually would and stretch that out in time. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of the same processes. And when, I guess also I've seen different kinds of time lapses, not just of projects and stuff, but nature and so yeah. on. Can you talk a little bit about, a little bit about choosing a subject? Right. Well, the, the classic subjects are uh, weather, uh, particularly clouds, um, flowers blooming, uh, things decaying and, and uh, disintegrating. There's a lot of that. Um, and typically, when you're, when you're wanting to, to pick what to shoot, you want something that is interesting over time. Okay. Um, like I was talking about, like a pattern that you can't see in the moment, like something that would like take a week or even like you know forty years to happen. Um, you take little intervals of it and put it together, 
so that after the fact you can kind of see what the pattern was. So um, when you're choosing a subject, you want to pick something that is changing, but also situate it in a context that is where, where something is still, where, where maybe okay. the environment is, is mostly still, the camera might move over time. There's something to, to, for you to, to recognize you know, what is changing and what is staying the same. So, okay, so it's, it's comparing, you have something still in frame to give context to what's moving fast. It, it, yeah. Okay. Like if you want to shoot clouds, um, there's many uh, time-lapse pieces of uh, the um, Empire State Building uh -huh. with like clouds like swirling around. You, could, you would never see that swirl if you're just looking up there. But it's actually the building being so steady and responding to light, um, but being right there in frame that helps make it the illusion work. Mm -hmm. Where you feel like the world is happening, that the weather is happening faster, right. and that it's sort of that it's like a natural pace, this really fast pace. Right. So if anyone out there wants to do uh, make their own time lapse, it, how where do they get started? What can they use? What tools do they need? Well, it's uh, you can use so much. In fact, you really don't need a fancy tool um, to to get started. You probably have a camera that you could shoot a time lapse with right so now. So any camera? Yeah. Yeah, web camera, all the way up to really high-end, nice DSLRs. Um, so they you, all can be socketed in some way. So let's say you have like a USB webcam like we use. What, how would we make a time lapse? What, would be, what tool would we use to well, capture? Well, you're, you're going to want to grab images. So mm -hmm. either have an application or write some like simple script that's going to grab a, an image. And then you need some means of getting, uh, triggering the uh, taking of the photo. Uh, people, uh, for a long time, uh, the only solution was to have a physical intervalometer attached to a camera that would um, sort of go through a time sequence and keep triggering shots. And you could tune it, and that's, people would, would tune these mechanisms so they could shoot like a, a flower blooming. And it, you know, it might take days under special light conditions to show the whole process. Uh, but now you can use almost everything. In fact, there, there are hacks for using like, you know, TI-83 uh, the calculator? calculators to trigger. Because uh, a lot of the cameras will have the, uh, they're designed to, you know, for you to attach a simple little button push trigger, uh, which is usually either like closing a gap or sending like five volts. So you can make some teeny little thing That's incredible. and just uh, and run that. We have a question, I think, from the chat. Yeah, there's a question in the chat. Um, the question is, uh, there was a nice zoom out in one of those videos. What are you using to pull back during the time lapse? Moot point blank wants to know. <laughs> uh, OK, so this is a really good time to jump into uh, to time lapse because getting like fancy DSLRs is pretty easy. Probably you can find somebody to loan you one if, if you don't have one. And uh, you can get gigantic images really easily um, tethering to a computer. You're saying because the, the send, the mega, it's, you're getting a lot yeah. of megapixels out, is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, for okay. a lot of, you know, for not that much money necessarily. Okay. Well, okay, so now you can cheat so well. You can, um, you can do all those moves that it, using like a traditional, like if you were shooting 35 or something, um, and you would, you so maybe film? would, shooting film, yeah. Uh -huh you might need to uh, either be moving focus, moving the camera to get these kind of sweeping moves. You can actually simulate uh, to a degree uh, elaborate camera moves by uh, taking a huge image and then reframing within it. And uh, you know, even using images that are way too big to play back as video. But you go on and pro you know, get things set up and process it through, grab the parts of the image you need for the video and then you have this nice, smooth video that looks like you had a crew of 30, you know, and, and a huge moving budget. Moving a camera or yeah. something, right. It looks like yeah. you're moving a camera. And that's actually one of the tricks. Okay. That if you just, if you were to say, take a huge image and just crop down to this little part and then move across, you would get a kind of pan, but actually people would feel like, oh, they're moving the, the image. Right. So you, the other part of cheating is you put the, the human handling back into it so uh, you, know, you move in curves and arcs and little S-curves. 
you use like ease in, ease out type so of techniques. So you're digitally speeding up and slowing down that, yeah. that digital pan you're making. Yeah, and making it not so direct. But you know, finding, you know, following along, you know, things that attract you in the image so that you can feel that human handling. And that actually helps the people seeing it to kind of forget that it's mechanically created. Um, and when, if, if you were a human operator and you were shooting that footage and it was happening in real time, when you were trying to hit that place where you wanted to get exactly that right image, you would be slowing down to kind of reach it. Well, you can you do that with your you know manipulation of photos, and people will feel like you've moved the camera. It's right. it's very handy. Right, because because when people operate cameras, it's, they're not robots. It's not just going like that, and so you you make it seem as though there's a human kind of yeah. moving the camera. And it gives you a chance to actually reinvestigate what you shot. Because you might not know what's interesting until after the process is done. So you, you could take a big wide vista yeah. and then take like one part of it, you're saying. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Maybe, maybe only one corner is interesting. And you can throw the rest of it away. And it will feel really intentional and exactly like you shot it for that. So then I'm, I'm a bit of a camera dweeb myself. And do you then shoot all this raw and raw? Like raw uh, image or JPEG? You can shoot. Or? Well, you want to shoot typically bigger than what you need, right? Uh, or at least you know have a little bit of uh, room to reframe. Um, you know, if you're creating something something for the web, then maybe capturing you know TIFFs or JPEGs is fine. They don't right. have to be so so beefy. Um, there's still enough room to get what right. you need out of it. My camera shoots, I think, 25 megabyte raw images, and that that'll fill up a card pretty yeah. fast. So I. I, I you have to take into consideration how much space you have, I guess. Mm -hmm. and well, that's, that's why uh, it's really convenient to tether to a computer. And uh, I mean, you can use fancy software, or you could just use a processing sketch that you, a teeny thing you, you write. Um, so pulling the images directly off the camera, plopping them on the computer's yeah. hard drive, where you've got uh, yeah. hopefully lots of space. So you, but you probably want AC power for the camera. If you're going to do something, if you're going to shoot for several days, and not sit there desperately trying to get the battery in without changing the camera, yeah. then you want to prepare for that. That's cool. Now, you talked about um, basic ways, maybe using a webcam or something. And we mm -hmm. were talking before about some more advanced things that you do. And what do you use, for example, when you're tethering your camera to your, your computer? Mm. There's, a, there's, I guess, there's a, the budget way you mentioned, and then there's yeah. more expensive ways. Yeah, uh, I, I tend to like tethering to a computer you, you, instead of like say using on-camera techniques, but um, I look to stop motion and animation tools. Uh, they're really hardy at handling lots and lots of images and multiple exposures, any sort of thing you want to do with them. Mm -hmm. So I use Dragon stop motion um, a lot, and there's also like I stop motion, which is really cool. So these are these are tools for animators to yeah. make like. Thing, like what's a, an example of a stop motion movie? Anybody? Um, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas yeah. is like stop motion. This is a tool that they would use. You use that to do a time lapse. You're not. Yeah, it's just a piece of the feature set, uh, but it's you're using its, you know, the, the software's ability to handle capturing lots of frames. And um, like you talked about shooting raw, uh, a lot of them will have options where you can you can grab huge raw files at the same time as grabbing little proxy files. And you need the proxy files to look at and see what you've got, because you might not be able to play back the raw files until you process them through lot, you know, some sort of batch image processing tool. Uh -huh. uh, but you can take the, the little proxies and throw those together and instantly know, oh, you know, I just opened it in QuickTime Pro, and this is what my video is. So oh. it will totally work. I can play it back. Cool. Great. That's great. Wonderful. Um, now, we were talking before about CHDK. Yeah. Um, this is, can you tell me what that is? Yeah, this is something it's the uh, Canon Hackers Developers Kit. Uh, it's been around, uh, I guess, a while now. It, it's, it feels like a, a very uh, established thing, even though I, I probably just started to learn about it a year ago. Um, it was a way for people to take their uh, single shot more like basic consumer grade Canon cameras and uh, substitute uh, these firmware hacks that would allow them to have complete control of all the elements. Firmware hacking like a, a point and shoot power shot 
Yeah. Canon camera. To make it more like a fancy DSLR. And you can use that to do a time lapse, for example. Yeah. Uh, you, there are a bunch of scripts, like in CHDK, uh, two uh, scripts that you can grab and, and, and manipulate that are very popular for timing stuff are one that at least the, its, uh, its name on your card will end up being Sunset 4, mm -hmm. uh, which is very cool because it does automatic exposure compensation. And the other is Ultra Intervalometer, which is very, very hackable and doing lots of other timing stuff. Um, you, you can grab these scripts uh, on, online, uh, read about them, read how to use them in your particular camera. And uh, as long as you can make sure to have control over exposure and over um, autofocus, like try to turn those off and so you right. can have a kind of fixed relationship, then you can design whatever interval you want or whatever trigger you want. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even trigger entirely not related to time, like say right. sound sensing or you know, some other like push button. Or cool. Well, you know, we appreciate you being here and talking with us about what you do for MakerBot and about all these different cool photography things. And hopefully the people out there will get an idea of what they can do to make their own timelines like they've been seeing. Now, I want to...